All right, let's talk about some of the newer biologics. Well, and, and bring up newer biologics, to your point, these new drugs are so safe and so effective that arguably if somebody had one little ditzel of psoriasis, gosh, the easiest and maybe the safe, because if there is an associated cardiovascular burden from even having that little bit of psoriasis, that it's a sign of inflammation in your body, giving one of these fancy new medicines in theory might be reducing the cardiovascular is helping. And the safety of them is so good that if it weren't for the cost, yeah. it might be a very reasonable yeah, right. treatment well, for mild disease. That would be a great hypothesis of test, right? Like one would want to do a big trial, randomizing people who have limited disease to one of these biologic sources, usual care, and then see if it could change the natural history of what's going on. But, 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 but wouldn't you have to track those patients over the next 30 years? I mean, not 30, but five, <laughs> five years or so to understand, you know, uh, which, as we talked earlier in the program, you know, we don't know who's going to go on to have severe, devastating disease, right? But we know who we potentially could prevent that in. People will show up in our office with psoriasis. Well, the problem is that if you're going to do this study over 10 years and they change insurers every two years, that's <laughs> yeah. five insurers. So yes. what I, let, let's, let's back up for a second. I'll go over the mechanism of action of the IL-23 um, inhibitors, which is what? Uh, Tiltrakizumab, Guselcumab, exactly. and Rizakizumab. Well done. Thank you so much. <laughs> you just bought the answer. Though. Yeah, so, well, you know, so IL-23 is a, is a cytokine, an inflammatory cytokine that helps differentiate uh, T cells into TH17 type cells. Okay. And their effector cytokine is IL-17, and they're sort of the downstream effect that causes epidermal hyperproliferation and what we physically see or clinically see as, as psoriasis. And, and so the 23s are really nice agents uh, because uh, they tend to uh, promote uh, high clearance rates of psoriasis. Um, they tend to be uh, work over the long term, at least the older versions of it, like ustekinumab. If you look at the, uh, the odds of staying on that drug long term, it's higher with that class of drug than, say, the TNFs, for example. Um, and so there's some big advantages. Uh, some new things we need to figure out is wh how well will they do for the joints. Those studies are ongoing. None are currently FDA approved for psoriatic arthritis, and we'll find out. Uh, we know that uh, ustekinumab uh, is approved now for Crohn's disease. It may get approved for ulcerative colitis. That's a big advantage for some of our patients. And we'll find out if 23s uh, play the same role there. Um, I think uh, one of the things we, we should point out is that three of the genes associated with psoriasis are interleukin-23 genes. So interleukin-23 consists of two subunits. The gene for each of those subunits is linked to psoriasis. The gene for the receptor is linked to psoriasis. In some ways, arguably, probably for a lot of patients, treating this pathway is getting to the root cause of their disease, or at least I like to tell yeah, them that. I, I think and, and, and another way to think about it right. is, if these genes are linked to the disease, the other alleles are linked to not having the disease, and so this is nature's way mm -hmm. of preventing psoriasis. Mm -hmm. So yeah. you're telling me you're a naturopath. Uh, uh, <laughs> that's my, what my patients want. But I think that's a really important point that Steve brings up. Because, you know, in the 60s and 70s, it was thought to be a, a, an epidermal disease. In the 80s, we started to recognize it was probably an inflammatory disease. In the early 2000s, it was thought to be a Th1 disease. It wasn't until we understood the Th17 arm of the immune system that it became clear that psoriasis is probably fundamentally a Th17 disease. And that's why the disease uh, has such enormous response rates. You know, some of our newer drugs, uh, roughly 85% of patients are clear, almost clear. You never see that with any of other chronic inflammatory diseases, right? So if someone mm -hmm. has Crohn's or RA, none of the biologics achieve remission rates in that percentage of patients. If it's 20 or 30%, you're happy. Uh, and so uh, to Steve's point, I think many of us feel like that's probably uh, you know, the, the secret uh, magic bullet, if you will. All right, what about, I know that you addressed this before, but, but just do it again. The long-term safety data? or do we have just short-term safety data of these drugs and this approach? Yeah, we have at least several years with the IL-23 and, and the IL-1223, um, we have data, we've, it's been used for over years, 10 yeah. years, yeah. 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 So I think, you know, used to Kenyamab, which blocks IL-12 and 23 has been around since 2009, uh, has a very strong long-term safety track record uh, when it comes down to it. And then with the IL-23s, they are newer drugs, so we don't have, you know, a decade of experience. We don't have experience in people who may have higher rates of, of problems like they have high history of cancer. But based on our mechanism, and they're more targeted, we predict they should be as safe or safer than what we yeah. have used you to mean, Kenyamab. You say based on the mechanism. We have people who have genetic deficiencies in the interleukin-23 pathway. 
you don't even discover them in the United States. I think in countries where they give BCG vaccinations, they may get some atypical BCG vaccination, but at least in the United States, I think they walk around happy and healthy and we never even detect that they have it. So okay. knowing that you can live without it makes me think that the, the treatment, and the treatment, well, you're giving the drug every three months, to every two or three months. And so there's some drug in your body and then you go out four half-lives or so, and there's probably almost nothing there, and yet the disease stays quiescent. There's a clear sort of pharmacodynamic effect of the drug where you could put people in remission and they can remain in remission for many months uh, without having any drug on board. So mm -hmm. they may be the first drugs that are truly disease modifying. You know, in rheumatoid arthritis, they talk about is a disease modifying drug. It's going to lower risk of progression to joint damage. Uh, the, the senses of 23s are probably disease modifying in a way. Uh, in my clinical experience, I have patients who I've treated with those classes of drugs. Uh, and when they do well, uh, they may come back years later off the drug and that psoriasis comes back, it may not be as bad as they ever were. You know, they still have fairly mild disease. So can I take these three drugs, the tildrakizumab, tildrakizumab, guselkimab, and uh, rikankizumab, put them in a bucket and say that in your experience their, their risk profile is about the same or is there a difference among them? How would you say, Steve? Yeah, I, 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 from personal experience, they all seem very safe. Yeah, so. And... Uh, I couldn't say there was a lick of difference between them in terms so of their safety, if I'm pick but based on, but you know, I don't have, it's not like a clinical trial when you're right. seeing me. I don't have like a thousand patients on each one carefully monitoring mm -hmm. adverse event rates. Yeah. But if you look at the, if, even if you look at the studies, which you see for serious infections, the rate is basically the same as the placebo. Group. Right. Yeah. I think that you know within class we tend to think of the drugs as having the, for more or less the same safety profile, okay. except maybe in the IL-17 is a drug called brodalumab that carries a, a black box warning for suicidality. Uh, it has its own. Well, it, it, it's a part of a clinical conundrum, but then we have to manage that for our patients. Um, but within class, for the most part, the drugs have fairly similar safety you profiles. You think that's true with TNF inhibitors? Um, it, well, so the, the, the infliximab probably has higher rates of serious infections, uh, but clinically speaking, you have to treat thousands of patients to notice a difference between the two.